warm welcome um, to everyone uh, for joining us for this talk uh, given by the um, organized by the Global 19th Century Group of the Center for Ideas and Society and co-sponsored generously by the English Department. I'm Susan Zeger, and um, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. And you are being recorded if you're here, so you're okay with that. Um, so today we're joined by Joe Hofer Robinson, who is a lecturer in 19th century literature at the University of University College Cork. And she has authored the monograph Dickens and Demolition from Edinburgh University Press in 2018. And this interests me because it's uh, it's it's very easy to do boring things with Dickens, in my opinion, um, if I can say that. And this is not. This is very interesting. This is um, thinking about how Dickens's works were um, kind of appropriated to uh, and cited in other texts that were seeking to remake the urban um, built environment of London in the mid nineteenth century. Um, and uh, Professor Hofer Robinson has also co-edited with Beth Palmer uh, a um, edited collection on sensation drama, 1860 to 1880. And her work has been published in the Journal of Victorian Culture, 19th Century Theater and Film, Dickens Quarterly, um, other uh, journals and books. And so you can see that her expertise is in um, both drama and theater history. And also these other kinds of questions of infrastructure and um, urban life. And um, I met her six months ago at a, a conference that she co-organized called Breaking the Network, Infrastructure, Internationalism, and Community Fragmentation in the Long 19th Century. And, and so that kind of gives you a sense of these two um, areas that one does not necessarily intuitively think of coming together, but which um, she has brilliantly combined in her work. So uh, her current project is uh, called Docks and Strange Places, and that is right off my street. And so I am very excited to hear what she has to say. Um, I think this talk comes from her, you know, this new research. So instead of uh, gabbling on, I'm now gonna turn things over to Joe. Thank you so much for joining us and um, please begin. Well, thanks very much, Susan, for um, a really generous introduction. Um, I'll quickly share my screen so I can um, get going. All right, can you all see that all right? Um, okay. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank, thank you again, Susan, and thank you to all, all of you for making the time to be here today. I really appreciate it and look forward to your feedback and questions at the end. So I'll begin this paper with what I'm not doing. Um, this paper does not suggest that theatrical representations can be neatly mapped onto the cultural histories of infrastructure or the lived experiences of historical actors. Instead, it examines how performance functioned practically in messily interrelated infrastructural processes. So Susan Starr, oh, sorry, my slides aren't moving forwards. Um, Um, so Susan Starr and Karen Frudela's foundational work defines infrastructure as a fundamentally relational concept. Although a Google image search of the term infrastructure calls up images of roads, railways, bridges, we shouldn't conceive infrastructure as abstract material technical systems. Rather, built structures are part of complex assemblages formed of codependent relationships between human, non-human, conceptual, and material actors. Ports, for instance, depend as much on physical and administrative human labor as they do upon ships, docks, warehouses, cranes, or lately, computer systems. Thus, they aren't finished artifacts, but dynamic processes that change as links are made and unmade. In this sense, infrastructure is social as well as material and technical, but this paper will argue it is also cultural. Specifically, I'm going to be arguing that in 1889, melodrama entered as another actor in the already complex and dysfunctional infrastructural assemblage called the Port, the Port of London. So investing practices of storytelling with the dynamic language of infrastructure emphasizes its capacity to afford a scaffolding for sh a shared cultural environment 
as well as its mobile adaptability to shifting processes and contexts of representation. This observation is anticipated by Dominic Davies, who has argued persuasively that colonial literature was an equally formative spatial sense-making technology as the construction of roads, railways, or ports in British colonies in the 19th century. My argument builds on his work and on compelling research by colleagues including Claire Connolly, Eleanor Hopkins, Nicola Kirkby, Ruth Livesey, Nitin Sinha, and Susan Seeger, among others. However, I depart from previous studies in two key ways. So first, I suggest that melodrama did not only function as infrastructure because it afforded a repertoire of widely understood and emotionally powerful symbols and forms, but that its performance had measurable real world impact. In this case study, melodrama functions instrumentally to express shared goals and collective identity during a successful protest and to enlist support for the movement via the, inter, um, via the international transfer of considerable amounts of money. Second, I emphasize that performance as infrastructure is dislocated, opportunistic and patchwork in character. It is simultaneously very powerful and fundamentally ephemeral. So far from presenting melodrama as a holistic part of court infrastructure then, this paper will argue that melodrama was not a um, a stable or continuous part of court operations. Instead, it entered this assemblage as a short-term fix, a patch, that enabled the court's fluidly interdependent but fragmented workforce to operate coherently, while the wider system of which they were a crucial part experienced a glitch. But now let's travel back to 1889, August. Activities across the Port of London have ground to a halt. And there is a great tailback of ships queuing out of the docks, unable to discharge or load cargo. The reason is a month long general strike, which has united the majority of the port's heterogeneous occupational groups. Chief among the strikers' grievances is the terrible pay and conditions under which casual staff were forced to work. These men were generally paid only four or five pence an hour, a measly income, and made even more precarious by the fact that the dock companies weren't obliged to employ the men for a full day and could dismiss them as soon as the job was done. It's hard to underestimate the significance of this event. Similar to when the Evergrip given became stuck in the Suez Canal, the strike disrupted transnational supply chains, communications and travels considerably. It left produce rotting on board ships and had huge knock-on effects for trade and the international economy. For London's port communities though, it seemed transformational. There was just simply no precedent for such united and far reaching industrial action. So one thing then that we have to understand up front is that port and river work was intensely fragmented and hierarchical. Among diverse bodies of skilled artisans employed in the port were stevedores, coal porters, shipwrights, lightermen, watermen, engineers, riggers, scrapers, ship painters, ballast heavers, sailors, and firemen. Kinship networks frequently influenced who was admitted into such elite areas of port work, and many of these groups also had long-standing traditions which helped to create strong, localized community identities based on similar experiences, status, and expectations. Working practices inside the docks thus tended to reinforce close-knit but segmented social networks extant in the waterside community and vice versa. Likewise, the men who made up the casual workforce didn't cons consider themselves to be a single occupational group either, and some of them didn't even identify as dockers at all. Henry Mayhew explains that many men undertook work on the docks on a part-time basis alongside other odd jobs or moved in and out of port work according to seasonal fluctuations in other trades. Nevertheless, representations of dockers as a motley band of down and outs belie the fact that much of the casual labor force was a regular body with a range of specific skills which carried their own rank and status. Then, on top of these very complicated relations within and between separate occupational groups, the Port of London's sprawling material infrastructure further obstructed the growth of a general trade union of port and river workers. Extending from St. Catharines by the Tower to Tilbury and Essex, 
The dock system spread over approximately 26 miles and was run by five separate companies. Thus, workers were also separated over, a lar over large distances and pay and conditions varied between the different docks. However, from August to September 1889, contemporaries witnessed the port's diverse occupational groups band together in daily processions through London to draw attention to their cause and as a means of fundraising. Their tactics were successful. The strikers raised £11,000 for the strike fund from the British public. Sympathetic Australians donated over £30,000, and there were further donations from continental Europe and North America. The processions themselves were a spectacular street theatre, and crowds of people turned out all along the route to watch. Contemporaries were hooked by the march's eye-catching dramaturgy. More than a show of numbers, protesters mobilised into theatrical devices from popular theatre, including tableau, costumes, song and props, and created a Manichaean narrative of persecution across asymmetric power relations, in line with the polarised moral world of melodrama. Melodrama functioned as an infrastructure for the port's complexly divided and geographically dispersed labourers to cohere around a shared body of expectations and repertoires of communication and exchange. Not only were the marches a stage for collective action, performing expressions of solidarity via the forms of melodramatic theatre also recast complicated industrial relations as a symbolic battle between good and evil. Melodrama thus mediated how the strikers' collective action was imaginatively organised, and in so doing, appeared to transform port workers' mere physical proximity into enabling interrelations, which allowed them to work together in a new, more unified way. Or, to appropriate Lauren Ballant's definition of infrastructure, the strikers' performances served to keep the fractured communities, spaces, and systems of the port practically bound to itself, in spite of major disruption. So let's turn now to look at the marches in more detail. The procession staged what Sophie Neal has called a savage strategy of poverty. In their story of the Dockers strike told by two East Londoners, H. Llewellyn Smith and Vaughan Nash of Toynbee Hall describe how fish heads, onions and tiny loaves were carried on pikes as an object lesson in Dockers Fair to the magnates of the city. Likewise, effigies representing the Dockers cat and the sweaters cat, the Dockers dinner and the sweaters dinner, the Dockers baby and the sweaters baby, diminutive and ample respectively, emphasise the Dockers' extre extreme destitution, even compared with other low-income groups. So Dockers appear kind of claiming their poverty as a means of presenting a collective identity. They appear unified by common experiences. Moreover, their performances suggest that they can be collectively identified by corporeal signals. So here, they're especially haggard malnourished condition. Now, even though the idea that one can understand and interpret coded physical signs is a melodramatic trope, taken individually, there's nothing particularly melodramatic about these touching emblems. The props are confrontationally sentimental, non-verbal appeals to the public to sympathise with and condemn Docker's exploitation. But when we consider them as part of a broader dramaturgy, the effigies, in, in fact, the facilitated expression of a clear narrative of persecution across asymmetric power relations. So Peter Brooks long since argued that melodrama is animated by opposition. He says the narrative creates the excitement of its drama by putting us in touch with the conflict of good and evil played out under the surface of things. The striker's representation is similarly Manichaean. Indeed, it follows a narrative pattern repeated across a great many industrial melodramas in which poor but virtuous characters are pitted against a wealthy villain. In 1889, the hated chairman of the dock directors, Charles Norwood, occupied this role. In polar opposition to the effigies of emaciated children and meagre dinners, expressive of the dockers' unjust collective subjugation, the Times reported that spectators watching the march on the 5th of September saw an effigy of Mr. Norwood on a gibbet 
and a man with a pantomimic head was also made to re represent the chairman of the great dot companies. And it was apparent that a strong endeavour was being made by the organisers of the procession to work the population into a dislike of the chief of these companies. The journalist was right to interpret these events as part of a broader pattern of representation in which the strikers mobilised costumes and props to cast Norwood in the role of the unscrupulous villain. The star described how on the 11th of September, a detachment of the procession came along with Norwood in another effigy. Norwood did not like the representation of him on the scaffold. He won't like the new one much better. He is shown as a dog muzzled and dressed up in convict's clothes with a label stating that he ought to have penal servitude for life. Repeated representations of Norwood as a convict explicitly position on the wrong side of the strikers polarized representation. More than simply accusing Norwood of criminal behavior, protesters' display of effigies transforms him into a totemic symbol of aggression. In melodrama, the villain is typically assigned for wider forces of evil or the cruelty of industrial capitalism. Norwood was personally unsympathetic to the doctor, Docker's cause and responsible for the hardships that they suffered to a degree. Nevertheless, the striker's representation also personifies abstract processes of, and effects of liberalization through him, because Norwood's actions are directly aligned with their ongoing destitution and exploitation. Enacting fantasies in which a powerful individual is published for his role in subjugating the less fortunate is clearly enjoyable, but it's also an economic means of doubly reinforcing the strikers' representation of their solidarity. First, contrasting series of props consolidate the representation of the dockers as a collective body, because it suggests that they are united against a common enemy, as well as by their poverty. Second, reducing complex industrial relations into a symbolic battle between good and evil creates a clear narrative of the Docker's wrongful oppression, and so enables feelings of gratification when the villain is imaginatively vanquished. Amusement thus becomes another shared experience through which the Dockers could be further united. Shared infrastructure is often supposed to provide the common conditions which permit shared experience and thus political consciousness to emerge. Recent research in the global south demonstrates particularly strongly how access to infrastructure is bound up with inclusion in the polity as a citizen or vice versa. In Britain in the 1880s, most casual dockers were still excluded from most forms of political enfranchisement, particularly the right to vote. The 1884 Representation of the People Act had enfranchised nearly 90% of employed man, men over the age of 21. Nevertheless, dockers were not universally included in the democratic body politic because the act still afforded enfranchisement based on property qualifications, which the few casual workers were likely to meet. And even while the growth of new unionism spurred confidence in trade unions among groups who had never been properly organized or represented, earlier unsuccessful attempts to unionize dockers prove how difficult it was to unite this fragmented body of laborers. Therefore, prior to 1889, casual dockers' claims to membership of the body politic or labor representation were frequently unrealized in legislature or combination. If we interpret melodrama as a cultural infrastructure with a recognizable and accessible symbolic repertoire shared by broad international publics, then we can see it as one of the few infrastructures of citizenship to which these men had access when they united comprehensively for the first time in 1889. For alongside a readily interpretable narrative model, drawing on Victorian popular theater pointed to the fact that strikers and spectators shared a common cultural environment. As well as helping the strikers to express and communicate their goals and experiences coherently, emphasizing their common cultural environment with the rest of the British population also allowed them a means of staking their claim to a place within the national community, even while their performances resonated meaningfully overseas. Now, music offered a, a, a further repertoire of legible cultural cues through which the dockers communicated a coherent message of wrongful oppression and exclusion. 
as Dockers asserted their right to fair employment conditions in concert with their equal claim to political citizenship. Contemporary accounts of their daily processions repeatedly draw attention to the fact that the strikers were accompanied by brass bands, which struck up, struck up La Marseillaise as they marched through, um, marched through London past the dock offices on Leadenhall Street. The song's association with revolutionary France both articulates the, dock, the dockers' current disenfranchisement and justifies their rebellion. For adding to the narrative polarization suggested by their visual props, and engaging metatheatrically with the urban environment. This performance likewise positions the Dockers as unjustly persecuted victims of the Dock Company's oppression. Their performances were actually satirical rather than threatening. Smith and Nash state that the city soon learned to take its invasion with equanimity and that office workers flocked out onto the pavements to watch the procession go past as soon as the strains of the band were heard. Nevertheless, the Dockers' self-identification with revolutionary France signals their sense of otherness and exclusion, as well as threatening the possibility of political violence and wide-scale revolution. The song may invite contemporaries to sympathize with their unjust treatment by the dock companies, but this emotional connection is achieved simultaneously with both parties' recognition that dockers exist at a cultural distance from the world of their employers, and occupy non-equivalent subject status. Reinforcing the wider public's assumptions of Docker's cultural difference and hybridity was contrary to the strikers' aim to present themselves as a reasonable and coherent body politic, deserving of fair treatment and recognition as equal subjects. However, this was actually redressed by the other musical cues in their performance. Alongside comical appropriations of the French national anthem, were regular performances of rural Britannia. In contrast with the mutinous overtones communicated by the former, the latter piece emphasizes the close connection between dock work and the British Navy, so central to Britain's imperial and military projects over the course of the century. Overtly jingoistic, rural Britannia does not evince that the dockers wish to overturn the current status quo per la Marseillaise but rather that they seek recognition within existing social and political structures. This isn't to say that rural Britannia couldn't also have been evoked satirically, but I still think that a more sincere overall tone is suggested by further musical intertexts that punctuated the procession, which as you can see on the slide were described by the London Evening Standard. Thus musical performances uh, proposed a broad model of belonging that cut across the strikers and the imagined community of spectators by drawing attention to their common geographic and cultural situatedness. Nevertheless, the dramaturgy of the procession still remained ambivalent. The bland played nationalistic songs at the same time as visual effects suggested the upside down world of carnival. Another dramatic technique deployed in the procession was the curation of tableau. On the 7th of September, 1889, the front page of the Illustrated London News carried a large image of costumed strikers mounted on a float who formed an eye-catching allegorical picture. Facing forward, Neptune and Britannia sit side by side. In concert with the musical intertexts, the pair signal close alliances between Britain and the sea and the marching court workers. Meanwhile, a doctor and a barber completed the tableau of um, the ship of a which evoked the shipboard crossing the line ceremony, during which those sailors who have not previously crossed the equator are issued with a series of terrible forfeits. Now, akin to the strikers' simultaneously serious and tongue-in-cheek use of music and effigies, these costume performers focused audience attention on the key relational dynamics between the strikers' cause and its wider implications for national prosperity and individuals' claims to political citizenship. As, but at the same time are provoking amused reactions. Um, Neptune is pathetically ragged and Britannia, as you can see there, she's relaxing with a pipe. So as in stage melodrama then, the action of the procession doesn't progress in a continuous flow, but it's segmented by intertheatrical devices that shift the tone of the drama between rad radically different registers, sentimental, comic, rebellious, and nationalistic. Far from a barrier to its effectiveness, however, 
The striker's melodramatic mode enables the inclusion of each of these elements without departing from their key objective to assert their solidarity and to enable clear communication of their reasonable of distress. In other words, melodrama enabled the strikers to cre create coherence from fragmentation and multiplicity, precisely what the, the processions were intended to achieve. Janice Norwood and Sophie Neild have thus rightly analysed the strikers' daily marches as very effective politicised street theatre. But at the same time, the ambivalence of the melodramatic mode signals that the connections asserted between the port's heterogeneous, divided workforce were provisional at best. Their performances temporarily occluded the underlying fragmentation and stratification of the port's community, but it didn't actually heal these um, existing divisions. Therefore, despite well-documented connections between infrastructure and the emergence of political or community feeling, the performances enacted in the 1889 processions actually aren't evidence of a newly unified political consciousness among port workers. If this happened at all, it passed very, very fleetingly indeed. In spite of the shared infrastructure of cultural forms and expectations provided by melodrama then, staging their solidarity didn't remove the inequalities and fragmentation within the court labor force. Instead, there remained a significant uh, distance between port workers' actual experiences of divided community structures and the very different politically and emotionally aligned socialities presented by their performances. Moreover, regardless of their successful campaign for an increase in dockers' wages and stricter regulations around minimum daily rates of pay and working hours, the strike didn't actually address the grievances of casuals across the entire port, and it failed to galvanise effective unionisation after the event. The industrial action of 1889 was led by men who were working on docks on the, on the north bank of the Thames. Here, casual dock and wharf labourers were more or less subject to similar systems of employment, even though they remained split between the different docks dotted along the river. By contrast, men who worked on the southern side of the water were commonly paid by piece rather than time rates. And what was more important, they were split into numerous occupational groups, each of which had its own set of working conditions. Ignorance of these differences stymied the inclusion of Surrey sites in the Great Strike, and it also proved difficult to enlist the workers at the Tilbury docks in the walkout due to their geographic distance from the main action, those are the docks that are way, way down in Essex. So as we have seen, the processions staged a spectacle of unity between the port's heterogeneous groups. As the men processed through the streets, many carried banners representing different trade societies, or dressed in costumes that were typical of their area of specialization or represented particular traditions. For Smith and Nash, East Londoners familiar with the color, vitality and pride of different waterside trades, the men's costumes made it possible to identify and distinguish between the port's various micro communities, even while they marched as a united front. But even so, the notable absence of Tilbury or Surrey side dockers is masked by this mass spectacle, and it goes unremarked in Smith and Nash's history. Melodramatic displays of community identity and shared goals were thereby unmatched by many strikers' real experiences. Moreover, ongoing fractures within the port's workforce are revealed by the fact that no general union of port workers emerged in London after the strike. Things had looked hopeful in 1889, then till its fledgling T. Octors Union, renamed the Dockers Union, increased its membership exponentially from a few hundred to 18,000 during the strike. However, this deteriorated again quite rapidly in, 18, uh, in the 1890s. Aggressive countermeasures from ship owners were partly to blame. But the idea that even all the casuals might be brought within a single centralized Dockers Union was actually curtailed even before the strike was over. Unaddressed by the movement's chief objectives, Surrey siders signalled their dissatisfaction during the event by establishing a separate strike committee and beginning to evolve their own union. 
which was itself factionally organized in autonomous branches based on occupational groupings. Added to this, large numbers of foremen and permanent laborers refused to join the Dockers Union, which they saw as a risk to the regular employment, benefits and status that they already enjoyed. Port workers thus remained divided across a com complex variety of trade unions, societies and benefit clubs, where they belonged to any at all. Even while strikers' melodramatic performances temporarily established a shared form of communication between occupational groups and between London port workers and international publics who donated to the strike fund then, these performances still remain kind of jarring. And that's because they simultaneously highlight the ephemerality and asymmetry of these social and spatial connections. Deterioration of those links between the strikers and their international supporters is a case in point. Speaking at the final rally in Hyde Park, which marked the successful conclusion of the Great Dock Strike, one of the strike leaders, John Burns, asserted that the financial support given by Australia proved that an international federation of labour was no longer merely an idea, a myth or a theory, it was an absolute reality. Most of the donations to the strike fund were supposed to have come from Austra Australian dockers, and Burns wasn't alone in interpreting their transfer of funds as evidence of deep-rooted interrelations between international labour forces, which might circumvent national political contexts. For another of the strike leaders, the publisher Henry Hyde Champion, Australian support marked the advent of a united international brotherhood of labour, and he subsequently traveled there in support of the general strike across dock and gas workers in New South Wales, Victoria and Melbourne in 1890. Meanwhile, Tom McCarthy, the leader of the Amalgamated Stevedores Union, promised that if it should ever be in the dockers' power, they should return the noble generosity of the Australian dockers as cheerfully and magnanimously. However, this pledge remained unrealized. During the general strike in Australia in 1890, the Illustrated London News reported that, and I'm quoting, it was, at, it was at first expected that money would be sent by telegraph from the trades in England by the same manner that the sinews of war were supplied by the people of Australia to the London dock labourers during the dock strike, but the funds are hardly coming in as was anticipated, end quote. Thus, flows of interaction and exchange between Australian and British dockers were not mutual or even. Imaginaries of unification via striker's display of the Australian flag and the assertions made during the strike leader's speeches again masked the fact that shows of solidarity had not resulted in durable relationships. The supposed capacity of performance to communicate shared meanings and messages around which new relationships might form is, then, is thus again revealed to be faulty. Breaks and disconnections remain within and between terrains and social worlds that this cultural infrastructure supposedly joins. The colonial histories of settlement and exploitation make this example of obfuscation and asymmetry especially disturbing. By 1890, the strikers' melodramatic representation appeared as a form of disinformation, which was designed to expropriate funds. Recalling the effigies displayed by the protesters, for example, the Australian National Review reflected that, as all of us now know, this money was cabled to England in hot haste to alleviate a supposed famine in the East End, the Australians having been told somewhat sensationally that thousands of women and children were at that time actually starving to death in London, end quote. The melodrama is thus implicated in bolstering unequal and unreciprocal relations between Britain and its colonies. In this sense, it was very much like other infrastructures of empire, which were geared towards extracting resources from colonial territories and channeling them to Britain through port facilities. However, similar to the apparent connections forged between the occupational groups in the Port of London during the strike, the relation between uh, the Australian and British dockers was short-lived, stressed, and partial. This allows us to see that the infrastructural function of melodrama actually didn't lie in its capacity to communicate shared meanings around which new relationships might form, 
even though this was the message that was being represented by the Dockers' processions. Instead, it facilitated mobility, interaction and exchange because it established a shared form of communication, which made the possibility that different performers and onlookers might engage with the content in different ways kind of irrelevant. Now, this is analogous to the infrastructural role that money performs. A shared monetary system doesn't lead different people to value the same things. Rather, it makes differences in valuation meaningless. As long as two people can agree on how much something is worth, it doesn't actually matter if they agree on how much intrinsic value this thing might or might not have. An alienated and alienating form of infrastructure, money doesn't generate shared meanings and durable relationships among the people who use it. Rather, it enables exchange and circulation to occur in their absence. Now, this is precisely what happened during the 1889 strike. Melodrama enabled the creation of temporary links between segmented occupational groups and dispersed international supporters, but these relationships were ultimately unsustainable. More than this, performance of popular theatre was envisioned as a form of global commerce in the 19th century. In the Wild Tribes of London, for example, Watts Phillips elaborates the transnational currency of melodrama's generic forms of representation. Sketching a cheap theatre in East London close by the docks, Phillips describes how the mixed international audience of sailors responds warmly to the performance of, well of a well-worn sentimental song. Jack gazes with feelings of mingled awe and admiration upon the dazzling creature in pink ribbons and pearly muslin, as, curtsying gracefully, she leaves the stage. And when far, far away those words are sung by rough voices in the forecastle, he will think of thee, beauteous maiden, and thy dulcet notes. Affecting to decry how sailors are hoodwinked by the combined effects of costume, limelight, and song, Phillips ironically exclaims, alas, poor Jack, there is nothing remarkably unique about the performance. Instead, Jack is captivated because he already understands the symbolic meanings encoded in the actress's costume and song and so can recognize her performed self-representation as a beauteous maiden. Graham Milne lucidly argues that sailor times are early examples of globalized urban culture, as hospitality and entertainment venues in seaports everywhere sought to appeal to a similar body of multinational clientele. Likewise, Phillips' actress dazzles her audience because she draws on a repertoire of tried and tested sentimental material that has already achieved a high degree of transnational circulation. As in Anand Singh's concept of friction, the performance described by Phillips exposes and reinforces fractures between global and local spaces and communities at the same time as it strengthens their interconnections. The actress knows how to elicit positive responses from mixed sailor audiences, which result in reciprocal flows of entertainment and remuneration. Phillips goes on to emphasize, however, that the sailors have no access to the actress's very different and difficult lived experiences. They will think of thee as Rosina Douglas, a seraph in pink ribbons and pearly muslin, never as Miss Rebecca Moss with draggled robes and dirty shawl, with unlaced boots and stockings ill to see, or as Becky Moss, who with fork in hand, that trident of power, turns the savory fish in oceans of bubbling oil while the elder Moss sits placidly by, watching with twinkling eyes the labors of his offspring. Becky achieves public legibility at the expense of personal subjectivity. The transnational interactions enabled through melodramatic performance are thereby envisioned as artificial and ephemeral. They're not genuine connections and do not promise to systematically improve Becky's circumstances, even though they grant her a temporary financial reward. In fact, Phillips sounds a foreboding note by positioning her performance alongside her gendered labor of care for her father. Both on stage and at home, Becky is compelled to enact prescribed feminine roles in which her significant work is hidden by theatrical artifice or within enclosed domestic spaces. If her performance as Rosina Douglas enables connections, it does so by obscuring her labor as well as her identity 
and entrapping her within uneven gendered power relations. The reading Phillips is useful to understanding how melodrama functioned as an infrastructural patch in 1889, because he rightly sees performance as an expression of precarity rather than as a means of overcoming afflicting conditions. In Phillips' book, actors deliberately assume alternative identities to conceal that hunger is a wolf never absent from their homes in order to entertain audiences. In 1889, Strikers made a show of their poverty as an expression of solidarity, but their display veiled the ongoing fragmentation which stood in the way of their full unionization. As in the wild tribes of London, during the Dockers processions, generic models of characterization, narrative and musical or visual effects from Victorian popular theater provided the basis for structured forms of understanding between diverse groups and actors based on contradictory assumptions of their fundamental differences and shared exposure to particular forms of mass culture that did not result in any lasting relationships. Therefore, melodramas, generic forms did not activate transnational understanding by communicating shared meanings and messages. Rather, it enabled circulation and exchange by providing a form of communication which by flattening the richly differentiated workforce to affect a colorful, memorable, and emotionally weighted imagery of court life, obscured much of their labor and experiences, and consequently, the court's infrastructural processes. So the true extent of performers' precarity is obscured in both cases. Melodrama is encoded with similarly asymmetric patterns of proximity and distance, belonging and inclusion, we see reinforced by infrastructure. The generic models repeated in Victorian dramas are, of course, not comprehensive. Studying Victorian theatre offers plenty of toe-curling moments in which we're confronted by offensive racial stereotypes that support the systematic exclusion of people conceived as other. Docs facilitated and were sites of fluid multiculturalism and hybridization as migrants, freed slaves, and ex-sailors settled in these areas and formed local alliances. It's ironic that melodrama's repertoire of stock characters, situations, and theatrical effects were mobilized by such a radically mixed, fragmented, and hybrid communities who were not necessarily well represented by the genre if they were given any voice at all. More than flattened, a great many dockside experiences were rendered invisible in Docker's melodramatic performances. Meanwhile, as Philip stresses, the connections affected by such artificial means are vulnerable on account of their radical emptiness. This chimes with Lauren Ballant's work on infrastructure. She argues that living together requires collectively understood terminologies, but that these are not necessarily reproductive. Docker's recourse to melodramatic representation is similarly paradoxical. It draws into play a form of communication that does not mimic their lives, experiences, or community structures, and yet which, in the act of performance, allows Docker's to claim a certain social space, forms of collective identity and citizenship, and public attention. This is partly because of melodrama's own ambivalence, its elusive political positionality, its mobile symbolic vocabulary, and flexibly segmented narratives. If we define infrastructure as connection without likeness, however, then the ambivalence and self-reflexivity of the representational form isn't actually a barrier to its practical and active involvement in infrastructural processes. The Victorian period is now rightly understood as a time in which the world became ever more complexly intertwined through processes of industrialization and liberalization. As a transnationally recognized form of mass culture, melodrama is another example of nation's cultural and economic entanglement. Still analysis of the genre as infrastructure emphasizes the contingency of these connections and the fractures between people and spaces that remained unchallenged. It directs our attention to the sheer opportunism accompanying transnational linkages even as we face our inheritance of their profound environmental and social effects. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Joe. That was a wonderful, um, brilliant talk, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful for it. I. Uh, and we have time for questions. Uh, and so if you have a question, um, I would love for you to um, unmute yourself and, and voice it. Uh, or alternatively, um, feel free to uh, you know, state it in the chat. Um, and uh, I can get us started. Um, I have lots of questions and observations and I'll try to um, you know, kind of tease out the big one that might be on people's minds. Um, certainly as I sit here in Los Angeles, 30 miles away from a port where there are, um, you know, many container ships idling and have been for a while, and this is a global disruption. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of us who think about um, labor, the, the resurgence of labor power, um, you know, we're hopeful about uh, in, in this particular economic moment um, and the length of supply chains. Um, you know, the, the great um, hope I think has been that people would mobilize uh, in different, you know, transnationally um, around the supply chains uh, that, that, are, <laughs> that are bringing us all together. And so, um, you know, when I was thinking about your, your analysis of, of melodrama and of effigies and of the sort of um, cultural representations in these strikes, uh, I was kind of wondering, like, is it, um, you know, you make, you make your point very effectively that it's the form and the medium of communication more than it's like the shared meanings. Is, is something like that um, is melodrama itself as a genre, do you think like available to people now, or has that genre shifted so much from, you know, 200, a hundred years ago um, and longer uh, that it, we would be looking to some other kind of genre to fulfill the same sort of thing. Um, and in particular, I think about effigies because your talk made me think again, like, oh, I've never thought about the effigy, but clearly effigies are still abundant in political protest. Um, and it never occurred to me that those are components of melodrama. So that at least oh. still seems to be part of it. Anyway, I invite your comments on all that. <laughs> what a big question. Um, well, I mean, I suppose, um, just in case I, I wasn't clear, I suppose, I don't think effigies per se are, are melodramatic I, I suppose I was more meaning to get at the um the kinds of narrative that the effigies allowed the dockers to create through the use of what I'm reading as props for some kind of theatrical representation um as far as whether melodrama is available as a genre now um for effective protest I I mean it's it's an excellent question I don't I think it's um it's one that I'd have to think about in more more depth I mean it's not like Melodrama has ever gone away per se. It's kind of relocated to action films and other things. But I, I suppose maybe what's more important is that you know melodrama is obviously known for its you know stock stock types as much as anything else. And maybe it's just that the the stock types are kind of changing and the the way that they're communicated is obviously different. You know, it might come through memes or something now that everyone knows rather than maybe a, a play. Um, but the, the point is that there's still certain types which are incredibly widely recognized and very mobile um, and available for both satirical or, or pointed commentary, depending on the kind of context that they're moved in and what they're put in dialogue with. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's particularly melodramatic, but I, I suppose just certain, certain features remain useful potentially. Yeah, um, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you. Uh, and especially the memes and the types have got me thinking about what's legible at that scale. Um, Alessandro, you have a question, please. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, excuse the not having my camera on, my, my camera fried. It's kind of like a machinic, uh, Zoom fatigue. Um, I, I was really interested in the talk. Um, 
I'm, I'm wondering, and this kind of uh, relates to Susan's questions about ports and choke points. Um, I guess I'm wondering about the form of the strike and, and, and is there a specificity to the strike in terms of uh, uh, the port and uh, the dock worker? Um, I'm thinking the paradigmatic notion of the strike associated with, you know, terra firme, the, the factory, the factory worker, what, what is the, the specificity in terms of infrastructure of it occurring in this site of circulation as opposed to production? Right? Would this be different, mm -hmm. this kind of notion of the strike uh, at the port as opposed to in a factory? Um, and, and again, would, would the, the notion of your, your, your notion of, of, of melodrama mediation work differently in these sort of two sites? Mm. Oh, that's an excellent question. Um... I mean, so I suppose to a certain extent, I, I mean, that you you may, this is a question that perhaps you've thought about in, in more detail than myself, um, that in in terms of the kind of the specificity of the strike as, as you termed it, I mean, in a factory, I suppose it stops operations um, and which can have plenty of knock-on effects, obviously. For supply chains or um, uh, you know other, other things, but um, with the with the docks, of course, the um, the effects are perhaps more visible. Um, even though the the docks in London were to a certain extent a bit outside of the, the city, um, and more so obviously as you get towards the larger docks that go down the river towards Essex, they perhaps are a bit out of view and it's part of the reason why it's important for the workers to come into, into the city and go through the streets as a form of protest. Um, but the kind of congestion and um, impact that you, you, you get quite quickly, I, I suppose, is, is maybe more visible than um, a strike in a factory, which might only be seen by a, a, a kind of local contingent unless similarly the, the workers take steps to make their protest a bit more visible. Um, I'm so sorry, I think I, I've rambled on and now I'm, I've lost lost my thread towards the second part of your question, um, whether melodrama would be useful in, in those other settings. Was that, was that am, I, am I right? Um, well, I just, oh yeah, sorry. No, I mean, I, uh, I guess would uh, yeah I, the, the, I guess it would be the, the would would it be different would it apply differently in terms of the I mean if if uh, I, I guess I'm thinking through the work of Joshua Clover, Clover on uh, strike riot strike or sorry riot strike riot um, where the, the 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 riot is all about the port city and the kind of you know seizing the 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 items that are circulating so it's a very different kind of uh, uh, movement as opposed to the strike, which as, as you were discussing is the, the dock working, seeking recognition, the making demands, uh, as opposed to just taking it, right? So, so I guess I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the mediation of melodrama in terms of those two kind of practice the protest practices. Well, thank you very much for a start pointing me towards that, um, that literature, which I haven't read. So I'll certainly go and follow that up. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I suppose the the whole point of the the use of melodrama in this context is that it makes the strikers it, it allows the strikers to create a narrative which is legible not only for themselves but also puts them in kind of a more empathetic relations with this kind of imagined community of spectators and a wider public. Um, previous to this, there were obviously the Trafalgar Square riots, which had been blamed to a large extent on. Kind of casual dock workers. So there was a kind of cultural association between this form of labor and um, people who were kind of going and breaking windows and taking things and generally causing chaos and mischief. Um, and I suppose that the whole point of and the strike leaders actually kind of made a made a big point of this that you know that the the men had to be kind of very well behaved, terribly well behaved all the time, um, in order for them to be heard and to be taken seriously. 
Um, and a lot of the kind of contemporary reporting does kind of regularly comment on the fact that oh policemen were in attendance but they actually didn't have to do anything the strikers were all really you know well behaved so they're kind of commenting on the behavior but it also kind of the the melodrama is what creates that narrative and allows kind of a sense of sympathetic engagement I think thank you um Heidi hi um, yeah, thank you so much, Joe. That was really um, so so interesting. And I, I have to say, just to kind of follow up on on where Susan was um, beginning, um, I, I, as you were talking, I was sort of thinking about how uh, I'm not sure if this is really the case. I would have to think about it a little more. But is melodrama being sort of co opted by the right? Because I was thinking about sort of melodramatic, you know, discourses and 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 like sort of Trump rallies. Um, and so I was wondering if maybe that's sort of what has, is happening today. And then I was also thinking when we were talking of the effigies about um, sort of recent comments by um, Anthony Fauci, who is, I don't know if you know who that is, but he's the sort of top epidemiologist um, uh, in, in America and he gets, uh, you know, he's sort of, a, 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 he's been villainized actually by, by the right about, um, you know, his pro-vaccination status and uh, the stance. And um, anyway, he recently was talking about how the difference, um, how protests are different now than they were before. Um, and he was um, talking about the work that he did, I guess, back in the 1980s and 90s to do with um, when, when AIDS uh, was first breaking out in the States. And he was talking about how he would attend these protests. He would go into sort of um, um, uh, the communities that were most affected by AIDS in the 80s. And they were very, in his words, like sort of theatrical and performative. And there are, you know, videos of these protests by, um, by community activists um, who were pushing the government to do more about AIDS. And um, they would, put, there was one where they, 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 there was a protest where they put Anthony Fauci's head on a, on a spike and were sort of walking it around. And the, so the, the, recently he was asked about this and he said, well, you know, no, I, I, I never felt um, like I was in danger when I would go into these communities. They were just trying to get my attention and it worked. And, you know, this is what he's saying now, who knows what he was really feeling at the time. But anyway, he was making a huge distinction between that and sort of the death threats that he's getting right now. So mm -hmm. I just thought, I, I don't know, there was sort of some themes that were coming up in what, what you were saying, I think that might resonate with at least those two sort of um, sort of health crises in the last few decades that we've been going through. Um, but anyway, but but I, my real question, because I'm in French studies, and so I was very interested to hear you talk about the use of the Marseillaise um, in these um, dock workers' um, performative melodramatic um, strikes. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about that. I mean, does it do they were they singing in French and or or do you know anything else about you know what was how how the song was used? I guess. I mean, so I I don't. I suppose the the evidence base is quite partial itself, and yeah. the references that I've come across to it, which are, are reasonably frequent, to be fair, um, talk about kind of just a, a brass band kind of going through the streets, so something that's going to make a lot of noise, mm -hmm. presumably performing the, the melody, but I, and perhaps people would be singing along, but I don't have any actual evidence to support that, and I think the important point wasn't only that they were using this particular song, but it was that it, they were using it at particular points in their regular route, which used to go through the city of London and as far as Hyde Park on Sunday. So a really long, long, long march, but it was that, that they were always playing this particular song as they were, you know, going through the city of London where the kind of, um, business side of the dock operations would have been located and so it, it's it's more that they're kind of using the song as a way of kind of communicating a message about their relationship to the the dock companies because they're playing this song outside of their offices mm -hmm. that's really fascinating thank you uh utitofan uh your turn 
Hi, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. First, I'm going to ask uh, a, a rather selfish grad student question. I was wondering, I tried to note all the texts in your works cited page, but I couldn't get for <laughs> everything. Because I, I find this uh, view of uh, performance as infrastructure very, very interesting. So I would want to assess those if possible. Yeah, but my question is, um, so a little bit of context, I, I work in African literature and while I was listening to you, it just made me think of oh, I'm so sorry, I think, um, I don't know if the problem is my end, but I, the, the feed has just stopped and I can't, I can't hear anything. Yes, I think Uti um, if you can hear us, you're frozen. Let's give it a few seconds and see if it resolves. If, um, if she can hear us, perhaps she can, um, if, if you could yeah. the question. Sorry, can you hear me? I <laughs> seem You froze. So um, if we, 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 we froze right when you started to ask the question. So if you could. <laughs> Re-ask the question and also maybe put it in the chat in case you freeze again. Okay, we'll wait a few more seconds to see if, uh, Uti, if we can get your question um, in the chat or? I'm really sorry. I think I'm now having problems with mine as well. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Joe, can you hear? I, I can hear you. I don't know if you can see me at all, but um, oh, I, I just got it back. I'm so sorry. I think I did something my with my computer. has decided to act against me, but I, I'm going to make it very quickly. I'm very brief. I was wondering about the effigies too, and the point that you made, that these are um it was i'm really sorry I, i'm afraid it's frozen again for me okay um i've asked udi to uh please put that question in the chat because um the freezing and unfreezing is um uh, not facilitating the question. So sorry about that. Um, let's hope that that works out. Joe, can you still hear and see me? I, I can, I'm so sorry. It was just a te temporary um, user error. Okay, so um, does it, while that happens, I'm looking around for other people's hands. If anyone else has a question they want to ask. Um, I'm curious. Oh, Jonathan, please. I have a question, but do you want me to wait for Udi or do you want me to go ahead? Um, I think go ahead and Uti, we're asking you to put the question in the chat um, while Jonathan asks his. So we hope to circle back Uti to your question. Okay, sorry. I, 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 I'm just really fascinated by this idea of the, of melodrama as infrastructure. And it sounds so helpful. And I wondered if you put this in, I'm a historian, so I end up always asking these questions in a longer historical context, because when you were show, talking and showing the quotes about the effigies and so on and out, and, and especially the, the picture with the um, Neptune and Britannia sitting side by side, it reminded me so much of the mayoral pageants that happened in London in the 17th century. And it's like, my goodness, it's like, so similar and they would sing and they'd like tear down parts of buildings so that they could get the parade through um and so i just wonder how and then there was this uh, asian parades that would happen in the 19th century from the lascars and i just kind of wondered how this might fit into this longer trajectory um and if this idea of melodrama might help understand some of these other kind of uh parade performances around the london docks previously i so i have to confess i'm um, so I'm, this is the first chapter that I've written towards my second monograph. And um, I, my, the one that I'm currently researching and hope to be the second chapter does talk in more detail about 
spectacle and pageantry in, in particular in in dock spaces um i i have a kind of sneaking suspicion at the moment that um and sort of building on susan stewart's work of course that kind of the the giganticism of these kind of um spectacles and and pageantry in in dock spaces was almost like a a, delib a deliberate mode of kind of closing closing down the viewpoint to a certain extent they're too big to take in everything so you kind of lose the detail or it kind of cuts off at a certain at certain points so um um, so it makes kind of certain histories or perspectives inaccessible. Um, so one of the examples that I'm hoping to use would be um, in during the Crimean War, the, one of the docks in Dublin was used for a huge banquet for soldiers, returning soldiers that was meant to kind of mimic similar things that have been happening in other cities in um, the UK. It was almost a kind of like, well, why can't we up on a, our soldiers at the same time as um, you know the British are uh, like uh, or honoring their tr troops, and the docks are chosen as the space that's suitably gigantic. Um, but obviously, this is really um, uh, quite ins insensitive, um, as, uh, to put it mildly, or to have this massive banquet that people could come and be spectators of um, in the years immediately after the famine. So it's it's just a, a kind of a, an an opportunity of kind of pageantry again kind of being used to to close down perspectives as much that rather than to open them but this is I'm at a very early stage with the research for that chapter so all of this probably sounds incredibly obvious at the moment so I need to think it through in more detail I'd love to hear more about the um Alaska um uh, parades through through London I didn't know anything about that Uh, okay, um, Uti, uh, you're back. Yes, uh, a thousand apologies. The internet is a hard taskmaster. So sorry, sorry about that. But to keep my question very brief, I was wondering if you could speak more about um, the range of symbolic meanings that the effigies might have communicated in terms of uh, view of them as static representations of those in power that were being um, represented. I'm thinking here about the potential of effigies to render these persons inanimate, to objectify them, to even uh, see sometimes it's just the head, like the fragmented uh, uh, bodies of this person in power. So I was wondering um, if you could speak more about whether there's a relationship between this de-animating practice and then the capacity of melodrama to animate this impulse mm -hmm. that you're speaking about. Like, is there, is there an interaction between those two facets? Uh, and if so, um, just, I was curious about that. Thank you for a wonderful presentation and apologies again. Thank you. Well, thank you for a fantastic um, question. It's incredibly interesting and something that I do need to return to think about it, I think in more, in more detail. I mean, in many ways, the kinds of symbolic uses of effigies that you're describing are, are working in a kind of um, contradictory way to the melodramatic reading that I've presented. Because I mean, I, I, I don't know if you disagree, but often feel like the um, the villain has the most agency in a, in a melodrama. You know, they're the ones that are impelling the narrative. It's a little bit like you. Definitely, you'd want if you were in a Disney movie, you'd want to be Ursula rather than the Little Mermaid, wouldn't you? Because you actually get to do something. Um, and uh, I um, and so I, you know, the 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 idea of the effigies being used to effectively defang um, the the chairman of the dock directors and to make him laughable. I mean, on the one hand, that is. That is certainly what they're doing, but it, it does kind of work against the um, the the kind of narrative impetus of melodrama. I mean, on the one hand, I suppose you've got like it's his, his the way that it's being presented by the strikers' um, dramaturgy is that like 
his cruelty is impelling their actions, of course, um, which would be in line with the kind of melodramatic narrative. But at the same time, yeah, I think that um, perhaps there's something more complex going on based on your on your question, which counteracts the, the melodramatic impulse. And uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll certainly look into it more. Thank you very much. Uh, and then if I can have access in some way to the references, I would love that because this is an idea I really want to push you further, but thank you. <laughs> I can then, I can share the screen for the last slide again, if you'd like that. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Um, okay, while that is happening, uh, let's see, did other people have a question and or Jonathan, did you want to um, say more about the Laskers? Sure, I can. Uh, you know, just in, in brief, I think it starts in the very early 19th century and it happens a few times and they um, get stranded in London by the East India Company, these South Asian sailors. And so they are, they are protesting to be relieved because they're in poverty, they're, they're stuck. Um, and they kind of have to sleep in the company warehouses and they're not allowed to sail out of England and they're not allowed to work in England. Um, and so they are, it's very similar to what you described. I mean, they're in, in deep poverty. And so they have some processions and they also have some religious processions. So I think there's a bit of, um, there's both in the literature sort of thinking about the, the religious processions. And then there's also more of the kind of political processions. And I'm not quite clear on the relationship or if any between them, but um, they do have these processions and they get in, I think if you look in the newspapers for the 19th century, they'll, sh they'll show up and I can, mm -hmm. I can dig around and look for some, um, for some other references too. Oh, thank you so much. That would be fascinating. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for your talk. Um, okay. If anyone else had a question, um, please ask it. Um, I wanted to circle back to uh, like kind of a big question that comes out of um, Alessandro, your distinction between production and circulation. Um, I feel like on the one hand, like our present moment of very elongated supply chains um, kind of makes production and circulation contiguous or continuous, you know, because if you think of all of the suppliers to make, you know, something like a car, you know, there are thousands of them, right? And so the actual assembly, it's, it's, it's less and less like a, you know, a centralized factory. It's like the factory is just where some of those parts come together, but then other parts, you know, something could be shipped partially made and then finished at a different location. You know what I mean? It's it's more, I think logistics um, in its 21st century moment kind of makes that more fluid. Um, and I was thinking about this uh, in relation to, um, Joe, your point about all the different trades, you know, mean that they need a common language because they're not all performing the same work, right? And you had that whole list of like the different trades that people were doing. And so I was thinking about, you know, your argument relies um, on this variety and fragmentation and hybridity and so on. Um, and so I guess I was just kind of uh, trying to think that through um, in terms also of, um, and this is going to sound a little random, but um, Timothy Mitchell's uh, carbon democracy, because he has a narrative there where it's because coal miners are working together in these little coal mines. And, um, you know, that's how they start building solidarity. And then there are coal mines everywhere. And so they're all doing the same trade and they're in there together and it's very intimate. And so that's how they develop a political consciousness. And then because everybody's using coal and consumers are using it, then the strikes get even bigger and then they can have general strikes. Um, and it's not very long after your, um, after 1889, you know, early 20th century, when we start seeing these massive, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in general strikes. Um, and so I guess this is like a large sprawling question about, um, 
you know, the formation of political consciousness, like in Mitchell's account, like once everybody is using the thing, then there's this culture that makes a general strike available. Whereas before that, you have to have some commonality, some specific commonality about the work, you know, that that creates the, you know, the political agitation in the first place. Um, and I guess I maybe this is just my own selfish like discontent with that argument. I'm not sure if I believe it or not, but I guess I was just sort of, I'm sort of asking you to talk in general about like the different trades and you know what like is it is it is melodrama the thing that brings everyone together like across those different trades or you know and did it come from smaller components and then all add up to this like cultural mediation or are there other routes towards um a general strike as opposed to mm -hmm. like a specific port strike Ooh, uh, well, I mean, I, this this could turn into a, right, a rather a rambling and long answer, but I'll I'll do my best to keep it concise. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things that has always fascinated me about kind of docs and partially why I began this project is that they're on the on the one hand they seem like um, just enclosed spaces, like they're quite discreet in some ways because they have these high walls around them. And so you, you kind of assume that like it's, you could treat it like a conference zone. It's, this is the space where all of these different trades, sailors, migrants, different consumer goods are kind of all coming together in this big mess um, and mesh. <laughs> um, but what I was found finding when I dug into it further is that actually because of the segmentation between the different working groups, it, you you actually get kind of parallel and quite segmented societies um, that sort of coexist with each other within this quite enclosed space, but don't necessarily overlap or have that much to do with each other really at all. Um, to the point that it influences, you know, the forms of socialising inside and outside of the dock, and also working practices. You know, a lot of these trades work in, you know, quite tight knit small gangs um, of about. 12, 30 people, and a lot of the people within this gang, um, say if you're a stevedore, are going to be kind of related, probably, or, or people that know each other really, really well. Because if if you're not, and you kind of can't communicate with each other and know what each other means well, then actually, potentially, your labour is more dangerous for you, um, because someone could drop a huge box on your head or something like that, and and fatal accidents did occur. Um, so actually segmentation is kind of written into the dock, dock labor in the way that it was working in the 19th century. This kind of meant two things for, um, for industrial action prior to 1889. Um, so first of all, you know, striking wasn't uncommon in the ports, but it tended to be quite localized and small scale and often very opportunistic, you know, particularly in the age of sale, if, um, you know, um, there were good winds and loads of ships came in all at once and staff were really needed, then workers could take up, um, could uh, profit by that, by withdrawing their labour. But obviously at times when, you know, there, there was a scare, um, and less ships to unload, um, then they, they, didn't, they didn't have the same kind of um, power. Um, um, it also meant that, um, because of these different working practices and different um, relationships with their employers. Um, stevedores were kind of contracted out, for example, whereas other um, casual, uh, work, casual employees might be employed directly by the dock company. So if a stevedore was dissatisfied, he could kind of circumvent to, and go to the master stevedore. Oh, sorry, this is all getting into far too much detail, but um, yeah, effectively, I think, I think um, segmentation is kind of written in and it does create, it's very kind of, parallel and, and fragmented working practices. This is also in, written into the history of the unionization because, you know, prior, um, prior to 1889, you, even where kind of la larger scale efforts were, were made, like the formation of the Labour Protection League in the 1871, this, um, um, that, that is also kind of factional, it breaks up and um, 
And so there just doesn't seem to be the kind of impetus to, to really unite everyone. And that, hence my argument that melodrama kind of, it, the point I think isn't necessarily so much that melodrama is particularly special, but just that at this moment, it seems to work in a really kind of practical way. It's not that it's like, massively influencing or rewriting the way that these people work together it just doesn't like it you know it, that would be a bit far-fetched but just in this moment it seems to provide like practical a practical what I'm terming a patch because it's um it's kind of improvised um even though these kind of performances work together as a way of like staging the workers dissatisfaction and their solidarity it it just, um, it, it, its effects are still kind of short-lived and, and it's, it's very haphazard. And, and melodrama as a genre kind of works for that kind of practice because it is a very kind of fragmented and, and, dis, and um, ad, in many ways quite an ad hoc kind of form that works in kind of flows of sort of emotional um, build up and release you know it's it's not something that needs to be continuous and so when you're bringing together such a a, a dispersed um context it, it kind of doesn't matter that um that melodrama itself isn't really that coherent a lot of the time um i've um possibly um wandered away from from your original point but um i hope that that answered some of the question anyway Yes, for sure. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Utita Fan, did you have another question? Were you raising your hand again? Yes, yes, very quickly. By the way, I got the text, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, I am working or trying to think through in my work uh, issues related to mask and masking traditions. And I'm thinking about mask in this context, in the context of African literature, of course, but mask as enabling you know, those um, who are carrying such um, performing, such performances to um, present themselves in ways that would be hitherto not available to them. So enabling some kind of forms of embodiment. However, uh, in your uh, analysis of the text, I can't remember the piece, you, uh, the title of the book you were analyzing, you did say something about the fact that public legibility for the character was at the expense of inner subjectivity. So I'm wondering whether that, in a, in a way, what does it do to the idea of um, this dead? So I'm thinking about the actors, the melodramatic figures as kind of forms of masking where they superimpose all kinds of identities on the subject. So does that invalidate the idea of mask as enablement, as a kind of, uh, the mode of empowerment, if the attempt by the you know, performers to present a certain mode of public legibility kind of invalidates their inner subjectivity. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that, like what happens there and what does that do to the idea of masking as enablement? Well, I suppose, I mean, my, my instinct would be that it kind of doesn't have to necessarily be one or the other. It would a lot a lot would depend on context. The the book that I was referring to is called The Wild Tribes of London by Watts Phillips. Um, in that he, he's actually a playwright himself, and so he's very alert to the fact that a lot of actors' lives in the 19th century are are really hard, and um, and a lot of them are very precarious, um, and that's and particularly because in this book he's kind of exploring East London, he does feature quite a lot of actors and insights into theatres where, you know, he goes to the green room and he's, he affects to be kind of really shocked and like the scales have fallen from his eyes because he suddenly realises that all of these sort of fantasies on stage are underpinned by um, uh, poverty and hunger. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that that necessarily undermines the idea that masking could be a form of an enablement, but I think it's more that in this book at least, um, and I found it useful to think through this in relation to the dock worker strike as well, 
is that this is something that is a, a way of commenting on really afflicting um, employment conditions and labor relations. And in which case, the, the masking in this case, because it doesn't actually change the, change the relations. I mean, it does to a certain extent with the, with the protesters, but it doesn't do it enough to make, mean that they're not impoverished. Um, I suppose I, 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 find, I find that problematic, but I don't, I don't think it necessarily has to be a comment on masking generally. It's just. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and thanks, Alessandro, for this uh, point about circulation and production um, being interchangeable and collapsed. Um, okay, we're running out of time, but if anyone wanted to um, jump in, this is your last chance. I just say briefly, I'm afraid I've not been able to open the chat and I don't know if um, um, if there are any kind of references that I should have noted down, I'm afraid I haven't been able to, to do that. Uh, the only thing of substance that you're missing is um, Alessandro writes that uh, regarding the collapse of circulation and production today, Macula factories work more as circulation sites. And in his work, Alan Sakula talks about container ships as floating factories. Um, so certainly true. Uh, there's a fantastic uh, Sekula retrospective at um, a London gallery a couple of years ago that I'm blanking on the title of. Um, anyway, thank you so much, uh, Joe, for joining us for a wonderful talk, really brilliant, like so much to talk about. And we just had such a rich Q&A. Thank you to everyone who participated. Um, thank you everyone who came and listened and um, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm just really thrilled. And um, Heidi, do you want to quickly um, jump in and advertise our next event? Yes, um, our next event is Friday, March 4th, 10 a.m. California time. Um, and it will be our own um, graduate uh, Global 19th Century Fellow, uh, Kim Kimberly Diaz, um, presenting on um, uh, Christian masculine Christianity um, and uh, in the 19th century. So welcome or uh, all are welcome. Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Joe, and um, see everybody down the road. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 I'll just I'll also, I'll just say, say bye, but thank you again for organizing and for Oh, to... absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I know it's, uh, you know, getting to be the middle.